This is, uh, John was asking me if, if like, he would understand this lecture being kind of coming right toward the end of the class. But I think in many ways, this lecture of all the lectures in the class is relatively self-contained. Um, it has one, and then undecidability, how there are some language that you can't write programs for at all. And we talked after that about reductions, about saying, OK, if this problem's really, really, really hard, and you can't decide it at all, then this problem would also be really, really hard, because I'm going to show you that if you could solve this second one, it would show a solution for this first one. And we know the first one's not possible, so that means the second one's not possible either. And that idea is called a reduction, reducing one problem to another by showing that the solution to the second would imply a solution to the first. And we did lots of examples of that. We, we turned problems about whether Turing machines can halt <laughs> to problems about whether context-free languages, you know, um, accepted the same grammar as another context-free language, whether accepted the same language as another context-free grammar. So we turned it into really practical questions. Somebody gives you two compilers, do they do the same thing? There's no way to decide that. And that's because if there was a way to decide that, I could write an algorithm to tell you whether a Turing machine halted or not, whether a program infinite looped or not. So we did these reductions, and but what we never did is I never really convinced you that, was, that there was ever even one original uh, undecidable problem. I said if there was one, then this one would also be difficult, and this one would also be difficult. But we want to go back today and prove maybe the most fundamental result in the undecidability part of this class, which is that there really is one problem that you just can't do, and the proof of it is by this idea of diagonalization. It's this clever idea. Second, yeah. uh, do you know what the program is? No. Oh, are you doing? It? You know, you can just do it on the tape. Are you doing it on the computer at the same time? Uh, that's what I was trying to do. Don't don't try, because okay. so Sophia was warning me that it might not work. So if you just do it on the tape, you're okay, and then okay. and then she will render it later. To stand up the whole time. <laughs> oh, I see. I see. But you have to look and. <laughs> you know, so I just, 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 just aim it more or less at me. Don't worry. I do a really good close-up of your beard right now. Can you still remove it? Probably. I got you a drink. You got. Oh, you got your. Uh, don't get tired. Okay. All right. We're going. Okay, we're going. We're live. All right. So. So the purpose of today is to show you that there really is an honest-to-goodness problem that you can never write an algorithm to solve. And I'm going to convince you of this in just a purely logical way. And it's an idea that started with a mathematician named Cantor back in the late 19th century, and then worked its way up through Alan Turing and Alonzo Church and all the people who did uh, computer science stuff in the middle part of this last century. And then it results in this wonderful proof that there's no algorithm at all if I give you a program and an input for you to determine whether that program is actually going to stop and say, yes, I accept this input. Right? So that's the problem that I'm going to work on. It's called the halting problem. Again, here's the input to that problem. I give you a Turing machine or a program, and I give you an input along with it. And I ask you, is this... Turing machine going to accept this input? Is it going to stop and say yes? Tell me, yes or no? All right, so that's the halting problem. The input is some Turing machine and a string that it's supposed to run on. And the output, yes or no, does M accept X? Does it stop and say yes? Now, if I asked you to go home and write an algorithm to do this, one obvious attempt would be to just take M, take the program, and run it. So you write a program that does nothing but read another program in, compile it, and execute it. You go, go borrow somebody's compiler and do it. You don't have to write the compiler yourself. Go ahead, take the machine in as input, take the input it's supposed to run on, and execute the program. And if it stops and says, I accept, then you say, yes, I know the answer. It stops and accepts. 
And if it doesn't stop and accept, then what do you do? Well, that's where you get in trouble with that method. That method's guaranteed to answer yes when, the, when it does accept x, but if the answer is no, if it doesn't accept x because it runs in some infinite loop, then your way of determining that will just be in an infinite loop. So maybe there's a more clever way to do it. Maybe you're supposed to really look at the program and start looking for funny for loops with weird initial conditions you know, that might not ever end. And after you do that, you can look for other strange things that might make the thing go into an infinite loop. And you categorize these into the 3,892 weird things that might make a program go into an infinite loop. And you write a 10,000 line program and you send in your candidate machine into this program and you check it for all the possible infinite loops and none of them are going to cause any trouble. And then you'd say, I know this machine accepts x. I don't even have to run it. I just checked it for no infinite loop. So I know sooner or later it's going to stop and, and say OK. That's a hypothetical. What we're going to do today is prove that there's no way to do that. There's no finite number of things that will let you check a program in general and make sure it will never go into an infinite loop. There's essentially an infinite number of ways a program can go into an infinite loop, and you don't have any way of being able to methodically check it in advance. Okay, and that's a very fundamental result. That means that there's a limit to what we can compute. There's a limit to what we can do. And it's not just this weird esoteric question, you know, does a program run forever? Well, that's not too esoteric. I mean, that's kind of important. Does it run in an infinite loop? But then this ends up making all these other problems we really care about undecidable. Two grammars generating the same language, undecidable. That's a really important problem. In the book, Mike Sipser talks about a famous open problem talked about at the turn of the century, I guess two centuries ago, 1900, by uh, David Hilbert. Hilbert gave a famous speech in Paris, which was based, Hilbert was the, um, the Renaissance mathematician of his day. Very well known, very renowned, and had his fingers in lots of different specialties, unlike the mathematicians of today, who tend to be famous only in one narrow specialty, except for a very rare few. He really was the, the, the king of mathematics in his day. And he gave a speech at this uh, turn of the century that basically said, look, here's 25 really important things that I'd like to know the answer to before the end of the next century. And it got a whole bunch of young and old mathematicians you know, churning their gears and working very, very hard. And I think it was 23 problems in his list or something like that. You can find this list on the internet. It's there. One of the things on the list was a method to answer questions like this. If I give you some arbitrary polynomial like this, does it have a solution where x is a whole number, where x is an integer? Now, you know how to actually solve that for linear equations and for quadratic equations. And there is a method for cubic equations. And there's a method for quadratic equations to actually get the exact solutions. And then you can just check if they're integers. But there is no general method, as far as anybody knew, for higher order equations. You would just do those numerically and get approximations. And he wanted to know, is there a, a procedure, some sort of algorithm, even though the word wasn't quite around in those days, but is there an algorithm for determining whether an equation like this has whole number solutions or not? Describe this procedure to me, and that will solve this problem. Now, Hilbert kind of implied that there is some procedure. You just have to work really hard to find it. The implication was that everybody thought that things like this were just computable. Anything mechanical you could do, it might just might be hard to find out how to do it. And then, many, many, many years later, it was proved, I think it was, oh gee, I forget the year, but it was way after 1950, I think. It was proved that this problem was undecidable, that there is no algorithm to do this. That there's no way, if I give you a polynomial and I ask you, does it have an integer solution, yes or no, answer that, there's no algorithm to do it. You might be able to do it in a particular case, but not in general. So there's a real life math problem that somebody really cared about to think that it was one of the top problems of the century. And not only didn't they come up with a solution, but the solution was completely unexpected. That there is no method. That's the answer to Hilbert's question. Not here's the method, but that no method exists. All right. So that's a mathematical kind of question that's undecidable. But there's many, many computer science questions that are undecidable. And we've talked about a lot of them. And many of them that relate to compilers, things that you just can't figure out, and you just have to 